This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Natural Hazards We here at the GM Word of the Week are no strangers to natural hazards. We've dragged ourselves from mires of sucking quicksand. We've dodged falling debris as massive earthquakes rock the world around us. And we've outrun massive tumults of ice and snow as they have come barreling down mountainsides in mighty avalanches. We've even hopped and skipped across tiny rocks to cross mighty flows of superheated lava. No, we're not globetrotting adventurers. We just play a lot of video games. And if there's one thing that's true of video games, it's that everything is trying to kill you. Not just the Nazis and the orcs and the zombies. Everything. The world itself is your enemy. This is especially true in the particular genre of video games known as platform games. No one is quite sure where that term originated, but it describes the fact that you're often maneuvering your character through a dangerous environment by the simple expedient of jumping between platforms, islands of safety, surrounded by hazards like bottomless pits or spike pits or lava pits or... Well, they are very pit-focused. The original platformer, not counting the highly debated 1980 arcade game Space Panic developed by Universal, was, of course, Nintendo's Donkey Kong. This was an arcade game, in case you somehow don't know, in which an abusive carpenter's pet monkey, fed up with the years of abuse, kidnaps the carpenter's girlfriend and takes refuge atop a construction site. You, the carpenter, Jump Man, must climb the construction site as the titular ape flings barrels and fireballs and pies at you. And we're not making up that animal abuse angle. That was in the original documentation that came with the arcade game. Now, the story of Donkey Kong is an interesting one. It starts with a young man in Japan whose father wanted him to do something with his life other than obsessing over Disney cartoons, drawing comics, and putting on puppet shows. His name was Shigeru Miyamoto. In 1977, Miyamoto's father, fed up with his son's artsy, daydreamy lack of ambition, arranged a job interview with Hiroshi Yamauchi. Yamauchi was the president of a company that had, until recently, made its money by manufacturing playing cards, novelty toys, and other junk. But Nintendo, that was the company's name, had gotten into a new business recently. Nintendo as a company was pretty innovative and forward-thinking, and that was thanks to its then-president Yamauchi. He had two qualities that helped him put Nintendo on the map. First, he had a keen eye for a product or business deal with a lot of potential. Second, he was absolutely ruthless and tyrannical. He'd taken the helm at Nintendo in 1949 after the company's previous president, Yamauchi's grandfather, had a stroke. He was in college at the time and didn't want to run the company, but his grandfather begged him to do so. Yamauchi agreed on the sole condition that he'd be the only family member working at the company. Fortunately, there was only one other Yamauchi at the company. Hiroshi Yamauchi's cousin was fired, and he took on the role of president. Young Yamauchi immediately encountered a problem, though. And it was just that. He was young and inexperienced and hadn't finished university. And so he had a great deal of trouble getting any respect. Shortly after he took the helm, factory workers went on strike for improved pay and benefits. They expected the young new president to give in to their demands immediately. Instead, he fired the heck out of the most senior factory workers. And when other people questioned the wisdom of that move, he fired them too. Eventually, everyone who hadn't been fired agreed that Yamauchi was doing an okay job and they should probably just get back to work now, sir. Thank you and sorry to have bothered you. Having established himself as a powerful leader by virtue of destroying anyone who challenged him, Yamauchi then took control of many of the decisions the company made. During his tenure, no product was produced without his personal approval. And most of the people who worked in important or creative positions also got hired directly by Yamauchi. He was the emperor of his company, and everyone knew it. 
But this isn't one of those cautionary tales about how total control and absolute domination will ruin you in the end. Nope. Because Hiroshi Yamauchi was really good at picking winners. And he was also always one step ahead of the market. Let's talk about gambling in Japan. Trust us, this is related to how good Yamauchi was at spotting a winner and thinking ahead of the market. Gambling is extremely popular these days in Japan, which is funny because it's highly illegal. Well, mostly illegal. Though, as of late 2016, it's not as illegal as it used to be. See, there's this law there in Chapter 23 of the Japanese Penal Code that makes gambling illegal. A first-time offense can get you a fine of 500,000 yen, or about 500 U.S. dollars. And a repeat offense can land you in jail for a few years. Now, the law has been enforced sporadically through the years, sometimes harshly, sometimes not so harshly. But the law does have a few exceptions. State-sponsored lotteries, of course. Horse racing, bike racing, and other public sports events. Those are all okay. But other things are illegal. Of course, illegal can be relative. Like we said, sometimes the law is enforced harshly, sometimes it isn't. Take Pachinko. That's an arcade game that's sort of half slot machine, half Plinko, and half those little plastic doodads you used to get in Cracker Jack boxes, where you have to shake them to get the little metal balls into the slot in the puppy's eyes or whatever. Pachinko is a huge gambling business in Japan. By 2010, Pachinko was raking in the equivalent of 500 billion, with a B, US dollars a year. And it's played in 15 to 20,000 parlors and arcades across Japan. But it's also illegal. How does this work? Well, it gets by for two reasons. First, there's a technicality. When you play pachinko, you bet money and, in return, you win a bunch of little rubber balls or tokens. And then it just so happens that wherever there are pachinko machines, there's also a few people who just happen to really have a thing for rubber balls or pachinko tokens. And they just happen to be willing to buy your tokens from you for actual money. You didn't gamble for money, you gambled for tokens. And then someone else just bought those tokens. See? This is precisely the same little clever loophole that allows Chuck E. Cheese and Dave and Buster to operate casinos for children across the United States. The second thing that protects Pachinko is that it makes the equivalent of hundreds of billions of dollars every year, and the Pachinko parlors always pay their taxes. When you are willing to pay taxes on hundreds of billions of dollars, suddenly the government doesn't really sweat whether you're violating the spirit of the law or the letter of the law or whatever. But back in the 1950s and 60s, this created a problem for Nintendo. Because some of their biggest products, playing cards and chips and tokens and stuff, weren't selling very well because of the ban on gambling. This included Nintendo's most popular product, a set of cards for playing the traditional Japanese card game of Hanafuda. So, Yamauchi started manufacturing and selling Western playing cards and packaging the rules for Western games like poker and bridge. The novelty of playing foreign games was enough to draw people in, especially in a time when American culture was just starting to infiltrate Japan. What you have to remember is that Japan had been utterly decimated by World War II. Its war with China and mainland Asia and then later with the United States had cost it a lot, and the counter-strikes by Allied forces, which culminated in the nuclear destruction of the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, had left huge numbers dead and had destroyed swaths of infrastructure. After World War II, the United States occupied Japan and helped the nation rebuild itself from the ashes. For the first time, Japan, a highly collectivist and fairly insular nation, was exposed to Western culture. And the juxtaposition of their nation struggling to rebuild itself with the prosperous America of the 1950s they saw in American media had a strong impact on them. The post-World War II generation in Japan developed a strong love for the golden age of American media. American stuff was popular. So Yamauchi's American playing cards caught on. But he wasn't quite done. No, no, that was the first part of a one-two punch. 
The second part was that when Disney's animated films started to reach Japan and also gain broad popularity, Yamauchi secured a licensing deal to produce American-style playing cards with Disney characters on them. And that product line turned Nintendo around. And when video games were starting to catch on, Yamauchi said, do it. And when a creative artsy type was sitting at his desk showing off a few drawings he'd made and some toys he'd produced, Yamauchi said, you're hired. Well, not really. And he made it clear that Shigeru Miyamoto was not just getting a job as a favor to Miyamoto's father. He said, if I hire you, it's because these things you made are good, not because of your father. And to make sure no one would ever question it, Yamauchi then asked the young Miyamoto if he could invent a new revolutionary card game. Miyamoto nervously shrugged and said he might be able to. And so Yamauchi sent him home. Two weeks later, Miyamoto got a call from Nintendo. The speaker on the phone said, We hear you have an idea for a new revolutionary card game. We'd like to hire you to make it. Miyamoto was hired. But he never made that card game. In fact, he languished in a low position doing some minor art for the company. Until one day, when Nintendo had a whole bunch of arcade units for a game called Radar Scope that had proven to be a complete flop just sitting in a warehouse. Nintendo wanted to reuse the hardware and put a new game in the machine, but they needed an idea. Yamauchi gave the job to Miyamoto. Miyamoto invented Popeye. Seriously. See, Nintendo had a licensing deal in the works with King Features Syndicate, the producers of Popeye, to make an arcade game starring the Sailor Man. Miyamoto developed the idea for a game in which the brutish Bluto would kidnap Popeye's paramour olive oil and hide out atop a construction site. Popeye would have to jump and climb his way to the top, avoiding obstacles all the way. But the deal fell through. And so Miyamoto changed Bluto to an ape, olive oil to a completely different wasp oyster damsel in distress, and Popeye into Mr. Video. It was a character of his own creation he intended to insert into all of his original works. The Mr. Video name was changed to Jumpman. And when the game reached America, he was renamed Mario after a gruff warehouse landlord who interrupted a meeting of Nintendo staff. Supposedly. That's the story, anyway. And Nintendo invented and popularized the platformer genre, became a gigantic hit, refined the platform game, and dominated the video game industry for decades to come. Except not really. Donkey Kong built popularity for the platformer genre, and certain elements may have helped inspire the genre. But it didn't invent the genre. See, Donkey Kong inspired a lot of imitators. And what they all had in common was that all the action took place on a single screen. Most often, you'd wind back and forth along that screen trying to collect all the things or reach the goal or whatever. It was pretty static. Meanwhile, in 1979, a computer programmer named David Crane had stumbled onto some pretty neat tricks of computer animation. He developed a technique that would allow him to display a moving, running stick figure, an animated character, and a way to have the screen follow that character. An animated sprite in a scrolling video game. Crane was working for Atari at the time, which was another company that had recognized the growing popularity of video games in the United States. Atari, founded by Nolan Bushnell and his friend Ted Dabney... Actually, hold, hold on a second. There's a funny connection between Atari and Nintendo. One that has nothing to do with video games. Hiroshi Yamauchi, who we talked about above, well, he wasn't really a gamer. He wasn't interested in toys and games. But he did have a passion for the strategic board game Go. In fact... He was a recognized grand master at it. Nolan Bushnell was also a fan of Go. He wasn't a grand master, though. But it did help him found Atari. Bushnell and Dabney were starting a company, see, to sell electronic games, and they had chosen the name Syzygy for their company. That comes from a Greek word that means coming together, and it pops up in astronomy and math and certain bits of Gnostic Jewish mysticism as well. But some roofing contractor in California was apparently also an astrophysicist or Gnostic or something, 
because he'd already taken the name Syzygy. Yeah, we, we kid you not. So Bushnell chose a term from the game Go, Atari. In the game of Go, it's the equivalent of saying checkmate, and it literally translates to, you're about to be swallowed up. But we digress. Atari was the brainchild of Nolan Bushnell. He'd first been exposed to video games when they were the sorts of things you could only really play in university computer labs when he studied at the University of Utah. He became enamored of a game called Space War, foresaw the potential popularity of video games among the masses, built a table tennis arcade game called Pong, which may or may not have been stolen from the first video game ever made, put it in a few bars, it took off, home console video games, yada yada yada, David Crane. David Crane left Atari in 1979. He was frustrated with Atari's business practices. Among those practices was aggressively short deadlines, lack of staff, and a focus on quickly publishing inferior games to market, especially those based on movie, television, and toy licenses, as well as a refusal to allow game designers to take credit for their work. He and his friend founded their own company, Activision, and they began producing video games for the Atari 2600 video game console. In fact, they were the first third-party video game publisher the first company to design and produce video games for another company's video game console. Oh, and Crane took three of Atari's best developers with them. Atari was, needless to say, a little peeved about all of this. In fact, Atari tried to use lawsuits and market pressure to maintain control over their own console. It didn't work, and Atari had to suck it up. And that was just the start, because Crane had also kept his scrolling stick figure game idea to himself. Activision started attracting a lot of talent. They treated their people well and credited their designers the way movies credit their actors, writers, and directors. In fact, they used their developers as celebrities to help promote their games, a practice that Nintendo would later adopt when young, childlike developer Shigeru Miyamoto kept cranking out hits like Donkey Kong and Super Mario Bros. and The Legend of Zelda. Now, it's 1982. Activision is doing well and Dave Crane is looking for his next project. And he remembers that little programming trick for the scrolling stick figure game. Crane starts doodling on a piece of paper. Stick figure, got it? Moving to the right along a path, screen to screen, fine. But where is he? A jungle? Sure, what's he doing? What does one do in a jungle? Collecting treasure, of course. He's basically Indiana Jones. How does he move? He runs, he jumps, he swings over crocodile-infested pools on vines. Or he jumps across them on the heads of crocodiles. Or he swings over quicksand pits. Or he takes the underground route. But there he has to avoid a deadly scorpion. In 10 minutes of scribbling, he developed the concept of the scrolling platformer. And in a couple of months of feverish work, he'd programmed the game. Pitfall, starring Pitfall Harry, for the Atari 2600. It was one of the most popular games ever for the Atari 2600. It sold over 4 million copies. And it didn't make a dime for Atari. Atari would keep paying the price for their business practices, though. In fact, everyone would. Everyone in America, anyway. Their focus on quick turnarounds and lack of quality, along with their refusal to work in alliance with third parties, led to a market saturated with garbage. People started buying fewer and fewer games, and the brain drain at Atari didn't help. Their best people kept leaving to start competing companies. Atari was circling the drain, and they refused to see it. Now, most people familiar with the history of the video game industry in the United States will know what happens next. It's been called the Great Video Game Crash of 1983. And most people think it was caused by a single failed game, a licensed game based on the 1982 Spielberg family blockbuster film E.T. the Extraterrestrial. And there is something to that. The story in brief is this. Atari wanted to release a video game based on the wildly successful film E.T. They secured the rights from Spielberg and Universal, they had to pay a lot for the rights to make the game. 
like more than they could possibly hope to make back unless they sold roughly four times as many games as there were Atari consoles. They'd already missed their chance to release the game alongside the movie, so they wanted to release it for Christmas. That would be the next best thing to putting it out with a movie. But that left them a very short span of time to actually make the game. They handed the project to a single programmer, Howard Scott Warshaw, and gave him five weeks to design, program, and test the game. And he did his best. He designed Yara's Revenge and Raiders of the Lost Ark for the Atari, for one thing. He doesn't deserve the blame people heap on him. Because with only five and a half weeks, Warshaw's game wasn't really good. It was bad. It's been called the worst game ever made, and we've played it. That's a bit harsh. It wasn't terrible for its time, but it was barely okay. It wasn't good, and it sure as heck wasn't going to sell four copies for every Atari console that existed. Still, word got around that it wasn't very good, and lots of copies were returned. Many, many thousands more were unsold. And so Atari collapsed. But as we pointed out, that was just the final nail in the coffin. Unfortunately, with Atari gone, the home video game industry in the United States pretty much collapsed. And it would remain a ruin until a company from Japan showed up and brought their own culture with them. And then Americans became enamored of the story of Donkey Kong and Mario, and Mario again, and Link, and Princess Zelda, and especially, which was Nintendo's bread and butter at the time, the platformer game. And that's also why we're so familiar with crazy natural hazards like quicksand and avalanches and landslides and sinkholes, and especially lava, and why we're always trying to work those sorts of hazards of the natural world into our role-playing game sessions. And that's why we're going to spend the next few episodes looking in detail at the real world's deadliest hazards, obstacles, and booby traps. Because the most exciting games are the ones where everything is trying to kill you. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by The Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. Thank you.